and say uh, you're all very welcome to this um, sixth Newman Centre online public lecture of the autumn 2021 series and I'm delighted to welcome our speaker uh, this week, uh, Dr. Odile Guillon. Uh, she teaches at the University uh, at ULB, University Libre de Bruxelles, and she's also um, a researcher at UCD, part of the uh, Neoplatonism and Abrahamic Traditions ERC funded project led by uh, Professor Dragos Kalma. Um, her research uh, uh, is on or has been on uh, Dun Scotus and Roger Bacon and today she'll be speaking about uh, Roger Bacon. Uh, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Odile and uh, let you take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much uh, Daniel Esmondizi for inviting me. And uh, of course, I'm very honored and happy to make a presentation today. Uh, I will try to share my screen. Um, if it works, but this isn't the right page. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, it has been a year since I started working in the Neoplat project, an ERC project at UCD under the, the direction of Dragos Kalma. And as a part of this project, I'm working in a commentary of the Liberty Causes uh, attributed to Roger Bacon, a commentary which constitutes one of the first uh, Latin commentaries of this important and often neglected work for the understanding of the structure of metaphysics at the very beginning of the 13th century. So the reason why I would like to talk about Roger Bacon today is related to this project, but it is not the only reason. And to understand it, I will first, it will first uh, be necessary to recall some elements linked to a period prior to the 13th century. Pierre Hadot, uh, the well-known specialist of antiquity, recalled in his works that contrary to what the rationalist and modern tendency may have thought, philosophy in antiquity was not only a speculative work, but was rather an art of living. This art of living is precisely the expression of the primary task of philosophy in the ancient world, that is to say, the search for wisdom. The expression art of living clearly shows that philosophy is not only theoretical or speculative, but rather and above all, practical. We could say that philosophy is theoretical in its development and it is practical in its finality. In Stoicism, the theoretical development of philosophy corresponds to the study of the three parts of philosophy, which are physics, logic and ethics, but the only finality of the theoretical de development is to prepare the soul to integrate, to ingest, if I can say, doctrines capable of regulating behavior and of being unified in a single ethical act. The abyss of the transition from theory to practice is a well-known philosophical problem. How and why should we internalize a theoretical discourse to make it the main tool of one's own ethical transformation? How is it that the philosophical discourse appears as the main tool to dominate passions that are, after all, indomitable? The ancient ideal of wisdom is understood as a trans transformative enterprise, which Pierre Hadot considered to be specific to the West. And the hope of being transformed begins with oneself. Wisdom is a work on oneself and not on the other. Epictetus explains that just as wood is the material of the carpenter, in the same way, individual and personal life is the material of the art of living. The art of living refers to an internal arrangement of the soul, that is to say to virtue, as well as to bios, which is life in its most concrete aspects. In this sense, philosophy is both an art of living and a form of life which supposes a certain use of the reason and of the body. Therefore, the philosophical act is not only an act of reason, but a conversion which transforms the whole being of the one who accomplishes it, since it requires leaving a mode of inauthentic life for an authentic way of life, that is to say, 
a life in which, and I'm quoting here John Sellers, in which man acquires a self-awareness, an exact vision of the world, inner peace and freedom. But why is our life inauthentic? Because it is deprived of order, and the trouble comes from the passions which are linked to the body. The Socratic analogy between passions and diseases of the soul was fully developed in Stoicism. As the body suffers from diseases, so the soul also suffers from diseases, which are the passions. And just as there is a health of the body, there is a health for the soul, which is known other than peace of the soul or wisdom. Finally, in the same way that there is a medicine of the body, there is medicine of the soul, and this is no other than philosophy. How does this therapy work? By means of exercises. Intellectual exercises, first of all, such as the production of maxims, which support action, but also bodily exercises, such as the habituation to poverty, for example. Pierre Hadot calls these exercises spiritual exercises. I um, put a quotation on the first slide uh, over here in French. I'm sorry, it will be the only uh, quotation in French. Uh, spiritual exercises to underline their particularity. In fact, they are not rational, strictly speaking, nor strictly physical. They are not exclusively psychological, nor only moral. They are based on the notion of habituation. In Stoicism, it means that the soul must be trained to produce good judgments. Musonius Rufus, for example, considers that spiritual exercise is a progressive way of distinguishing real goods from apparent goods. This learning is presented like a digestion, uh, this is the metaphor of Seneca, a metabolization, so to speak, of the philosophical discourse so that, so that it becomes a second nature. These spiritual exercises are therefore methods of internali internalization uh, of the philosophical discourse. And I'm quoting here uh, on the first slide, a passage of uh, Pierre Hadot's book, uh, Exercice Spirituel et Philosophie Antique. Uh, this will be the only quote in French, as I said, but uh, it would have been a shame not to quote him in, uh, in his own language. So I just quickly translate the passage in Italic. Uh, the word uh, spiritual allows us to understand that these exercises, the spiritual exercises, are the work uh, not only of thought, but of the entire psyche, of the individual, and above all, it reveals the true dimension of these exercises. Thanks to them, the individual rises to the life of the objective spirit. That is to say, he places oneself back in the perspective of the whole. Now, this progressive and continuous work begins with rational work, that is to say, critical work, and it consists in a rupture with everyday and common opinion, which is painful and unnatural, as Plato uh, already said. It. Philosophy is torn away from everyday life and initiates a new life. And paradoxically, this birth to a new life is a return to a lost state of balance. As Pirado has shown, this is all the ambiguity of the term conversion, which comes from the mixture of two Greek concepts, epistrophe, which evokes the return to an origin, and metanoia, <clears throat> which evokes rather a renewal, <clears throat> sorry. Conversion is therefore a return to the origin, which is at the same time, the beginning of a new life. But this regression is only wisdom if it is experienced in the world. The wise man who has been thrown into the heart of the disaster and who for this reason forgets all his philosophical work cannot be considered a wise man. Wisdom is theoretical, is not a theoretical, sorry, but practical. The martyrdom of Socrates, of Seneca, and later in the Middle Ages, that of Boethius, is the opportunity for philosophers to recall that the re theoretical work is not an escape from the world, but on the contrary, an investment in the world. Seen in this light, wisdom appears as a self-finalization of life, but this is only from all point of view, as a contem contemporary man or woman, to the extent that we left behind the idea of a finality of the world in which this self-transformation makes sense. 
this point was the subject of a controversy between Pierre Hadot and Michel Foucault, who sees spiritual exercises as techniques de soi, technologies of the self, and exercices de subjectivation, exercises of subjectivation, which consist in a certain number of operations on the body and the soul in order to transform oneself. And these are historical forms of subjectivation. In Pierre Hadot's view, this interpretation misses the cosmic dim dimension and the collective dimension of wisdom in the ancient world. And therefore, it, is com it completely distorts the idea of wisdom. To work on oneself is to work with others within a cosmic order. Philosophy as wisdom is therefore a social and a cosmic practice. Nevertheless, most philosophers seem to reserve this attitude for an elite. This is one of St. Augustine's main critics of ancient philosophy. Wisdom cannot be effective if it is addressed to an elite. It must be addressed to the multitude. And faith in Christ is precisely the tool of this universality, because Christ is the universal mediator who brings the salvation of the world. It would be too long and tedious to explain here in detail the legacy of the ancient wisdom in the Middle Ages. Let's say in a few words that medieval thinkers present themselves as the true generators of the ideal of wisdom. If we limit ourselves to Pauline and Augustinian Christianity, the idea of Christian salvation replaces the ideal of antique wisdom. True and perfect wisdom is that of faith in Christ and in Christian God. This substitution is, of course, far from innocent because it presents wisdom as the only prerogative of the Christian God. Augustine very often repeats that there is no salvation apart from true religion, Nostra Christiana, as he says, which is also true philosophy. In this sense, philosophy is integrated into a soteriological uh, vision, which articulates the rational work of philosophy with a dimension unknown to men of antiquity, that is faith. Faith adds something to philosophy, which includes it in Christianity, because the ethical purpose of philosophy is known other than the object of faith, which is revealed to humanity by scriptures. Now, this integration reduces philosophy to being only a preparatory and ancillary discipline, reduced to reasoning and speculation. And these are held to be empty if they are not finalized by Christian theology. The general movement in the Middle Ages, from um, Pierre Hadot, will be that of despiritualization of philosophy. Uh, <laughs> transliteration from French, but um, I think it is understandable, despiritualization. That is to say, the reduction of philosophy to theoretical and reasoning exercises as evidenced by the scholastic practice in universities in the 13th century. The phénomène église, the church phenomenon, as Henri Corbin called it, amplified this tendency since the inst this institution watches over the doctrine and the exercise of faith and ritualizes the whole life of believers, replacing progressively spiritual exercises. In medieval times, the question of the ethical finalization of philosophy became the question of the relationship between philosophy and theology. In the eyes of medieval thinkers, philosophy became the servant of theology, ancilla theologiae, so that its role was reduced to the usefulness it presented for theology as a preparatory condition for it. The Middle Ages generally considered that philosophy reduced to itself, that is to say, without theology as its finality, would be of no specific use and in addition, would be the expression of human pride, the aim of which is the appropriation of the works of reason, what St. Paul called the wisdom of fools. However, we will see that for medieval thinkers, philosophy and theology were not so much competitors as complementary disciplines. This means that if it is true that philosophy is nothing without theology, theology is, without, is nothing without philosophy either. Jeremy Hackett, who is one of the best known commentators on Bacon's works, argues that philosophy must leave the tension 
between the sacred and the profane, open and undetermined, for it is the only way to achieve its ethical purpose. Hackett's thesis, at first glance, echoes Addo's assertion. Indeed, the division of the search of wisdom into two extreme positions, which are reason reduced to itself and faith, faith sorry, reduced to itself, that is to say, to extreme rationalism and to extreme theologism, this division then is avoided if we preserve the theological finalization of philosophy. Nonetheless, as this finality has become the exclusivity of Christian theology, philosophy reduced to itself no longer appears as a simple discursive and vain reasoning, very far indeed from ancient wisdom. Moreover, Hackett reverses Addo's thesis by asserting that the divorce between blind reason and blind faith is the product of an extreme rationalism, the rationalism of modernity that led to essayism, rather than both rationalism and theologism. This conclusion leaves me, leaves me skeptical because it avoids the thesis of the despiritualization of ancient philosophy, resulting in part from its integration in the Christian context. This is the reason why, <laughs> coming at last <laughs> uh, to the point, uh, this is the re reason why I would like to speak today of wisdom in Nikon thought. And the work I'm going to focus on here will be the Opus Maius, written at the end of 1260, at the request of Pope Clement IV, and which, wist, uh, which is a wisdom work, uh, as um, Timothy uh, Johnson quoted, uh, of a literary genre which is neither strictly philosophical nor theological. Let us return for a moment to Pierre Addo's analysis. One of his hypotheses is that the medieval university, the one which saw the birth of intellectuals, as Jacques Le Goff has shown, would have been one of the places where philosophy has been transformed into a theoretical discipline. Unlike the monasteries, where the daily practice of spiritual exercises maintain a continuity with ancient wisdom, universities would have confined themselves to speculative exercises. Now, this is precisely the critique that Roger Bacon addresses to the masters of Faculty of Theology of Paris in the 13th century. Roger Bacon is a well-known uh, thinker in German and Anglo-Saxon countries and in Italy. In France, in French countries, it's quite different. French commentators, after having unrolled the carpet of honor for him at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, because they saw him as a precursor of Auguste Comte and of empiricism, have relatively forgotten him since then. What is first striking about him is the ambiguity of most of his positions. He belongs to the episteme of modern philosophers in his ambitions to develop the sciences and in particular experimental science, but also due to his inventions like the flying machine, like the diving suit, for example. But one would rather tend to place him in the episteme of ancient philosophers if one considers the finality that he gives to all these sciences, which is known other than Christian theology. To put it in a few words, Bacon is both surprisingly modern and really conservative. And every time we admire the visionary nature of some of his projects, we have to admit that they belong to a bygone era. Bacon wants to restore lost wisdom by promoting, as he says, the magnificent sciences like languages, optics, alchemy, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, and experimental science. Why? To fight the purely speculative tendency he observed in the universities. But he also wants to give all its effectiveness to philosophy as the best tool to promote Christian theology. All this requires, according to him, a reform of education, in order to reform the whole of society so that it becomes a Christian republic, the only one capable of bringing earthly happiness to humanity. We must therefore be careful not to judge his ambitions so as not to fall into the trap of historical evolutionism, which would consist in judging Bacon's work in the light of progress in science or in the light of history of faith. In a way, it is an effort specific to all historical and even anthropological work. Timothy Johnson states 
I quote, and I put the right slide. Bacon's effort, it is at the end of the quotation, Bacon's efforts to understand the dynamic of reform, uh, the categories of revelation and experience, suggest that the anthropological religious aspects of his insights are crucial to understanding the genre of his wisdom works. Science is for Bacon the most admirable uh, in his own terms. It could certainly have said with Charles Gustave Jacobi that the only purpose of science is the honor of the human spirit. Except that for him, if science leads to wisdom, it is because it challenges itself to support the achievement of spiritual ends within the church and therefore to provide the material conditions to achieve these spiritual ends within the state. Uh, he mentions, for example, life extension, fortune, welfare, peace, and social justice in order to help Christianity to spread abroad without bloodshed. But precisely, this science has been lost. It has been lost following Bacon due to a series of errors. These errors are due to the state of sin in which men find themselves. And when he opposes wisdom to the multitude, or to the vulgus, as he says, Bacon does not aim so much at the simple man without education as at the master in theology. The multitude then refers to people who practice science without practicing virtue, whereas virtue clarifies the mind, as Bacon says. So Bacon claims the superiority of morality over science and of experience over speculation. Indeed, no theoretical science gives an answer to the reason for a simple blade of grass, he says, nor to the reason, no, not the reason, sorry, why the smallest insects have so many legs or colors. And not only does speculative uh, philosophy not lead to the truth, but even uh, leads to prefer falsehood to the truth. The first book of Opus Maeus denounces four major uh, errors, uh, that which consists uh, in blindly fol um, following authority, uh, I put the quotation here on the slide, that which consists in following habit, that which prefers the common prejudice and false science. And in addition to these four general errors, as an introduction to the whole um, education program uh, he proposes in um, Opus Maeus, seven particular errors can be found among theologians. I will not go into the details of the explanation, but I will just try to highlight the issue. The first error is the importance given to philosophy within theology. Once again, Bacon aims to condemn philosophy if it is practiced for itself or for speculative purposes only. Precisely what is aimed here uh, is the teaching in the form of questionnaires in scholastic method and the rage to write, uh, to use Bacon's own expression. Uh, as it is evidenced by the theological summas, the most famous of which is, as he ironically puts it, um, uh, heavier than a horse. <laughs> uh, it is Alexandre de Halle's uh, summa. Bacon's critique is aimed first at the method itself, the scholastic method, since it gives rights only to the arts of trivium, the grammar, the logic, and the rhetoric, more than to the arts of quadrivium, the arithmetic, the geometry, music, and astronomy, or to other sciences such as experimental science. But he also criticizes the content of the disputationists, since theologians seem more interested in speaking of being as being or of the union of the soul and the body than in studying theological matters such as Trinity or the Incarnation. In addition, most theologians read and comment on Pierre Lombard's sentences instead of reading and commenting on the Bible. Rather than discussing empty questions, he says, theologians should study and teach the Bible using the magnificent sciences like optics, mathematics, astronomy, and experimental science, as Roger Bacon's masters did, uh, who are uh, Robert Grostet and Adam Marsh. This does not mean we, to reject speculation, but to put it in um, its rightful place as an intellectual power whose practice is supposed to lead to happiness only if it is finalized by moral. Consequently, the promotion of science, which, uh, which one would tend to classify among Roger Bacon's most modern gesture, does not not seem so modern insofar as it is rather a way of doing biblical 
exegesis. At the same time, Bacon completely misses what should call, be called the modernity of his century, which is the very peculiarity of this century in the history of thought, namely the unmatched speculative hail of theological summers. This is enough to show why it is inappropriate to speak of modernity in either case. But to go back to um, the denunciation uh, made by uh, Bacon and uh, in, in the introduction of uh, Opus Maius, but biggest error is that theologians ignore the literal meaning of the scriptures because they ignore the properties of things. Actually, what does it take to achieve wisdom? Reading the Bible because it contains all the revealed wisdom. How to read the Bible if it is full of allegories which at first glance resist understanding? by relating the meaning of these allegories to the properties of things, Bacon says, and this is what he calls literal exegesis. Now, what is the science that gives access to the properties of things? The experimental science. What is it exa exactly? I will come back to experimental science later, but uh, shortly, it is the most common experience, the sensitive experience, insofar as it is supported by technical instruments and a kind of reproduci reproducibility, so to say, which prevents it from being a pure empiricism. And thanks to the literal meaning given by the properties of thing, it thinks uh, it will be then possible to develop the spiritual meaning through well-conducted associations. Bacon therefore reduces theology to a symbolic theology, which no longer has anything to do with the contemplative interiorization developed since, since uh, Neoplatonism. But the restoration of wisdom cannot be limited to the study of sciences. Too many sins have withered the theological life so that in the present state, Christians are not able anymore to live the life of the ancient philosophers who discovered so many sciences thanks to the virtues. The search for wisdom, therefore, begins with a promotion of the past. This is not a nostalgic gesture. In reality, Bacon presents the past as being what epistemically grounds all science, since all science, as we're going to see, was delivered to the first patriarchs and prophets by a divine illumination. This way of thinking is a classical anthropological scheme. What should be presented as superior is presented as anterior as Françoise Héritier underlined it uh, many times. Even when he develops in another context his remarkable inventions like the flying machine, for example, Bacon will present them as, as the rediscovery of past inventions uh, transmitted in the Book of Secrets. This leads us, uh, us to talk about the origin of science. The origin of science and the origin of unity of science is the divine illumination given by God to the first patriarchs and prophets. Founding the origin of science in a divine illumination is quite surprising. In any case, this doesn't mean that science had to be delivered as it is, that is to say, without human having to make an effort to understand it, since even the, partier, the patriarchs sorry, had to verify it through the, their whole life to fully understand it. By force of circumstances, circumstances, other individuals, uh, much less virtuous than the patriarchs, we have to do the same. But precisely, all humankind is in a state of sin, so that the science revealed in this first illumination is forgotten and must be restored. But if only a few men receive this illumination, then the history of science will be the history of its transmission. And what is the guarantee of this transmission? The scriptures. Wisdom is hidden in the literal sense of the text. The search for wisdom is therefore an exegesis, a textual exegesis, thanks to logic, to grammar, to rhetoric, but also to poetry, as well as a natural exegesis, thanks to natural philosophy as a whole and experimental science. Without these sciences, says Bacon, Scripture would forever be a closed fist uh, folded in his hermeticism. And on the contrary, without scripture, sciences will be the blind development of a search of meaning that would never end. Science is useless if it, not, if it is not at the service of the good. The history of the transmission of wisdom 
uh, is presented by Bacon as a genealogy of wise men who belong both to the religious world and to the philosophical world, including the first Jewish patriarchs and prophets, um, as well as Greek philosophers, Muslim and Christian theologians, but also the Indian and Persian scholars. Its deployment is not linear, but punctuated by periods of lights and periods of shadows. Of shadow, sorry. Let's come to this history. Science was transmitted to the Chaldeans through the sons of Noah, and then to the Egyptians through Abraham, until Solomon saved it from darkness. The Egyptians, and especially the Greeks, received the wisdom from, of the patriarchs and greatly contributed to perfecting it. Plato himself received exactly the same wisdom as the Hebrew patriarchs. Among all these philosoph philosophers, Aristotle is the greatest. He is to philosophy, says uh, Bacon, what St. Paul is to Christian wisdom. He wanted to restore, says Bacon, the glory of the science delivered by the patriarchs, a science that he testifies to having received from books which have no reach us unhappily. Yet, his science remains incomplete, imperfect, and calls for completion by his successors. It is the role of Avicenna. <coughs> there is a microphone. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe somebody should close. There we go. Uh, sorry about that, Odile. <laughs> Someone left their mic on, yeah. Odile, I think you're muted now. Sorry, Odile, I, I overreacted and, and ended up muting you as well. Well, do, do you hear me? No? Yes, you're back. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Yet, his science remains incomplete, imperfect, and calls for completion by his successors. It is the role of Avicenna to come and complete the works of Aristotle, as it will be later the role of Averroes to come and complete the works of Avicenna. This dialectical, this dialectic, sorry, will continue until the end of time, for perfect wisdom will never be the prerogative of a sinful man. Nevertheless, it is not the very foundation of wisdom that is as at issue here, that is to say, uh, that which has been delivered to the patriarchs, but what is called to evolve in history, that is to say, the particular sciences. Philosophy is presented here as the only worthy heir to the wisdom of the patriarchs, so much so that Christians would do well to draw inspiration from the lives of these wise men. But philosophy is also the possible path to loss, because there can be a good or a bad use of philosophy. The good use of philosophy, which goes from Plato to Robert Grosted, and maybe to Roger Bacon, consists in the good use of particular sciences in order to restore the initial wisdom. The wrong use, and the, okay, and let's see if you, you see the slides. Um, oh yeah, forgive me not trading all the, the quotations, we can come back to the quotations um, in, in the discussions, but anyway, it would, take a lot of time to read all the quotations and those these are illustrations uh, of uh, what I'm just um, trying to explain. The wrong use of philosophy, which goes from Nimrod to Prometheus and Mercury and even beyond, consists on the contrary in relating the works of reason to human and in taking pride in what is actually the property of God. Thus, the misuse of philosophy does not concern the value of science in itself, but consists in the imperfection or the incompleteness to which it condemns itself by considering itself as autonomous. The history of wisdom is therefore the history of the legitimate or illegitimate use of reason. It is also the history of the foundation of reason, and this requires an order in the knowledge. The history of, sorry, I'm just, no. 
The history of science has enabled us to identify the notion of use as an important key to understanding the classification of knowledge. The sciences are classified according to their greater or lesser utility in restoring wisdom. This classification of the sciences is part of a reduction to all arts to theology, reductio arsium ad theologiam, as Bacon designates it. I will not go once more into details into the details of classification of the sciences in the work of uh, Roger Bacon. This is an extremely difficult subject and still unresolved, actually. Uh, but I will simply try to underline what is at stake here. Bacon is not the only one, nor the first, to present a classification of knowledge. It's a constant preoccupation of thinkers in, uh, of antiquity and of the Middle Ages. The sciences are generally classified according to the ideal order of progression of the human mind in the acquisition of knowledge. This classification must therefore articulate the pedagogical uh, order in view of the ideal order of knowledge. The first order starts from what is best known and most familiar to us to go up to what is the, mo what is the most complete and complex. The second order is rather deductive and starts, on the contrary, from what is the first known in itself and not for us. Aristotle considers that the higher sciences, the object of which is known in itself, are supposed to provide the lower sciences with, them pri with their principles, following a scale of dependence that he calls subalternation. For instance, Metaphysics in the is the highest and the first science and provides geometry with, with its principle. Geometry, in turn, provides astronomy and music with their principles. Lower science is said to be subalternated, that is to say, subordinate as to its principles. And higher science is said to be subalternative, if I may say, that is to say, it gives its principle to the lower science. In the Aristotelian system, it is metaphysics which provides the other sciences with their principles, which earned it the status of supreme science, that is to say, an epistemically founding science. But Bacon refuses this principle. On the contrary, he uh, proposes the opposite idea. The process of knowing is the following. Starting from the simplest, the most elementary and incomplete things, we go back to the more complete, uh, uh, ones which are also the most perfect. Therefore, sciences that come that come first are not not sorry the most perfect, but on the contrary the most incomplete. But what is meant by an incomplete science? It certainly doesn't mean that this or that science is in itself incomplete. But rather, it brings back to the idea that an incomplete science is a science that is finalized by something else than itself. Thus, an incomplete science is a science that is a mean for a finality different from itself. The way the sciences are organized is the following. The less perfect science provides principles to the most perfect. These principles are actually the conclusion of the less perfect science. To put it in another way, the conclusions of the less perfect science are the principles of the more perfect science. And this is the exact opposite uh, of subalternation. In this sense, what we have to um, take a look at is that less perfect sciences are the causes of more perfect sciences because they provide them with their principles and their means of action even if the posterior sciences are more worthy in eminence because they are the finality of the previous one. This classification benefits from being examined under the aspect of completeness and incompleteness. The less perfect sciences can be considered as incomplete as they call for a complement. This complement does not intervene, in, intervene inside this science, but as the finality of the previous science. But the ultimate finality is theology. Theology is, as Bacon claims, the complement of philosophy. Uh, if we take here philosophy as designating all the sciences. Actually, theology adds something to philosophy that philosophy cannot include in itself, faith, and more precisely, faith in God and Christ. What is interesting here is that this complement is not added like something foreign to philosophy. Rather, philo theology adds itself as what comes to organize the sciences from inside, so to say. 
Finality is the key of organization of all sciences. Bacon says that this finality is present to all sciences like a general to his army. This metaphor comes from Aristotle. A general is present to his army, not only in person, but above all, in the form of the organization of his armies. What manifests best the presence of the general is the military strategy that sets the troops in motion. In the same way, theology is not something external to all the sciences, but what organizes them in their movement. The whole point is here, not to add theology as something foreign to philosophy, but as something that appears to be intrinsic. What is at stake here is to show what is truly common to philosophy and theology in order to gain the adhesion of non-Christians. Therefore, the history of wisdom is not the dialectical history of the progressive unveiling of theology. Otherwise, it could suggest that wisdom is something latent, which must necessarily reveal itself. Rather, history of wisdom appears to be the history of a perpetual choice. I use here a concept, uh, even if Bacon, the concept of uh, choice, even if Bacon doesn't use the idea here, but uh, shed some light on, on the explanation, a choice between light, the reason carried by its uh, theological finality, and darkness, the reason that takes itself as an end. This choice is present from the very beginning. Hence, it is not something that suddenly and ultimately appears at the end, but something that reappears every time as a possible redemption. Bacon takes up Augustine's attempts to present um, uh, Christian theology as intrinsic to philosophy. And this is, I think, this is what uh, Bacon means when he says that philosophy transcends itself in the science of divine matters. And this is also the reason why I would like to deepen now, very shortly, the relationship between philosophy and theology. As Jeremy Hackett rightly stated, uh, the link between philosophy and theology cannot be understood except with regard to the common origin that is revealed truth. The patriarchs and prophets did not receive the divine law only, but also all the parts of philosophy. The first patriarchs are also the first philosophers. The source of all truth is a divine illumination, but this one has not only be been given at the beginning of all time, it radiates any manifestation of reason in history. The first illumination given by God to the first patriarchs is relayed by scripture and sacred literature, which form the tradition. This is like an indirect, an indirect sorry, illumination available to anyone who wants it. Even the everyday knowledge needs enlightenment from God, because our soul are like a passive potency that must be actualized by the active divine intellect, divine intellect. This illumination is itself supplemented by special illumination. Hence, the function of philosophy is instrumental from the start. In reality, philosophy aims first, this explanation, uh, sorry, aims first to deploy the content of scripture and to explain it in such a way as to convince unbelievers. Secondly, to attract as many converts as possible to the common ground that philosophy constitutes with theology. Thirdly, to reduce all science to Christian theology in order to reduce all knowledge to the knowledge of God as its in intrinsic finality. And even, fourthly, uh, shocking as it may be, um, to bring in uh, all the knowledge necessary to produce weapons for the defense of Christendom, like the burning mirrors uh, that Bacon uh, takes up from um, Avicenna's works. In short, the utility of philosophy can only be, be measured in relation to theology. In other words, if it is taken for itself, it is of no interest or use. How could philosophy do it if its sole purpose is to bring human beings to a sinless state? But philosophy has no other utility than to serve theology, and moreover, it owes all its power only to this end. That means that if by chance philosophy wanted to become autonomous, it would lose all its power. Let us remember that science depends on in its development on the exercise of virtue. 
and this constitutes the Baconian uh, translation of ancient wisdom, and Bacon could have here made himself the best defender of Pirado. But theology here is exclusively Christian theology. Bacon rec recalls it uh, in a violent passage, which states that just as the Hebrews were right to steal gold from the Egyptians, theologians are right to plunder the gold of philosophy because it is theirs. Yet, Bacon is not a violent theologian who is resentful um, towards philosophy, on the contrary. And uh, what is that aim? What is the aim of this finalization? That's a good question in the end. To make theology more effective. Why is that? To build a universal and peaceful Christian Republic. It seems to me that if Bacon devotes so much effort to leaving philosophy open to the tension between its self-finalization and its theological finalization, and at the same time to opening up a space for the development of sciences, it is in order to elevate theological discourse to the greatest possible extent, that is, to make it universal. In Bacon's view, universality is, of course, on the side of Christian theology, like Augustine, indeed. But what he seeks is clearly to universalize the discourse and not to reduce it to a theological discourse closed on itself. In this sense, it is for him as legitimate to condemn the proud philosophers who believed in the autonomy of philosophy as to condemn the theologians who believed in the speculative autonomy of, philosophy, of theology. Sorry. And this is the reason why the only possible solution is to present the exteriority of theology to philosophy as a point of view, the point of view of the non-believing philosopher. Conversely, the Christian point of view reveals the intrinsicness of Christian theology to reason. So whereas the non-believing philosopher perceives reason and faith as two things foreign to each other, the Christian philosopher sees them as complementary. It is therefore necessary to be a Christian for uh, Bacon to perceive the perfect universality of all the sciences. Surprisingly, Bacon's position here might seem very close to that developed by Henri Corbin in Le Paradoxe du Monothéisme. Faith is not so much the way of believing exoteric, uh, so to say, uh, this expression, uh, Henri Corbin's uh, main expression, that is to say the naive consciousness uh, which considers uh, things as external to it and discusses then the concept, as what appears in the way of thinking esoteric, when it turns out to be intimate with philosophy. To put it in Bacon's terms, philosophy appears, appears to be autonomous from theology only for the point of view of the unbeliever. As, and as long as he maintains this distinction, the unbeliever or the non-Christian cannot achieve real universality. The observation, this observation allows us to raise the question asked by Pierre Hadot once again. Where does the loss of philosophical spirituality come from? Well, of course, I have no scoop. <laughs> I have no clear answer to that difficult, very difficult question. Uh, indeed. But it seems that the history of ancient wisdom takes on a very special turn here. For Bacon, philosophy only makes sense in relation to its practical finality. This finality is not exclusive, at least, at least for Bacon, because it presupposes the development of sciences, which is ess essential to the universalization of the, the theological discourse. As Jeremy Hackett asserts, this supposes that philosophy leaves open up an indeterminacy, a fruitful tension between the profane and the sacred, between the temporal and the spiritual, against reductive tendencies that Bacon violently rejects both extreme rationalism and extreme theologism. This argumentation is quite convincing and Bacon could have passed for the defender of Pierre Hadot's thesis in the middle of the 13th century, except the fact that we do not see why the Christian theology is the one that finalizes the whole history rather than another theology like Muslim or Jewish or Neoplatonic or Aristotelian, Aristotelian sorry, theology.
So ancient wisdom is saved at the cost of the monopoly of Christian theology under the pretext of fighting against extreme rationalism and atheism. But this monopoly is founded on the development of sciences. Let us turn now to the experimental science. All science comes from divine illumination given in the scriptures, which tells us everything about the nature of things. Exegesis needs specific tools, and these tools are the sciences. Among these sciences, uh, experimental science makes it possible to discover the properties of things. Let's give an example, maybe not the best one, but the simplest one. St. Augustine comments on Christ, who said, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. This, uh, this allegory asks to understand the nature of the serpent and the dove in order to understand that the serpent exposes its whole body to protect its head. Likewise, the Christian must expose everything to protect the head, which is Christ, and do nothing against faith and love. Whoever does not observe the serpent for himself misses the literal meaning of this allegory and therefore makes himself unable to understand it. Well, even if uh, this example does not quite reflect the power of experimental science as Bacon developed it elsewhere, nevertheless, it makes us aware of what is at stake. Experimental science, which belongs to philosophy, reveals the nature of things. Now, the scriptures also reveal the nature of things. In other words, scripture has the same material foundation as philosophy. They both seek the nature of things. But how can the scriptures reveal the same content as the most basic experience of human life? Raoul Carton maintains that for Bacon, human cannot know anything without receiving. Human is a naturally educated being, and God is the first teacher who enlightens the minds of the most virtuous individuals. Now, all teaching assumes that the pupil checks what has been given to him by the teacher, not to check it really, but to digest, if I can say, or to appropriate it. The patriarchs themselves were given a very long life to develop and verify the truth received from God. Now, the verification is done by experience. First, the sensitive experience, which, ver which verifies what reasoning cannot verify. Secondly, the special and internal illuminative experience, which reinforces the sensitive experience. And of course, I do not have time here to go into the detail of this distinction between sensitive experience and internal experience. But what is, it, what is at stake here seems to me worthy of the greatest interest. To make knowledge his own, human must make an effort to seek the truth. This effort is presented here as being the experimental verification of a knowledge that has already been given to him. If we can come back to Pierre Hadot's hypothesis, we, can we suggest that experience is for Bacon the substitute for the interiorization of philosophical discourse? Bacon knew Seneca's work as well as the Christian authors, and he could not fail to give some place to the process of interiorization of the philosophical discourse. Would experiencing the nature of things replace spiritual exercises? Not really, not exactly, at least at first sight, because experimental science itself refers to its ethical purpose and therefore to virtues. But virtues are rather a condition for exercising knowledge, while experimental ver ver verification reflects the sorts of process of internalizing knowledge. If it is the case, it is something very remarkable and at the same time very confusing because the experience is always what is most personal. But when it comes to experiencing the nature of things to verify a given truth, it is no longer personal, but external, so to say. And this raises a paradox between what we could be, what could be called a logic of increase. These are not uh, Bacon's terms, um, these are mine, but anyway, <laughs> I try to clarif clarify uh, what he says. Uh, could be called a logic of increase uh, linked to the nature of the experience as it is external. And on the other side, a logic of deployment commanded by a first illumination 
and referring to the experience as internal. Bacon thinks he solves this paradox by attributing the logic of increase to the state after the fall in which human finds himself. himself. The state after the fall is a state which makes perfection impossible. As perfection is never reached, uh, it is possible to think the history of mankind as a logic of increase, an infinite logic of increase, uh, infinite only de jure, since man himself can put an end to the, sta the state of sin. The increase thus constitutes, so to speak, the iterative side of history, that is to say, what is called to be always completed, while the illumination gives in an intuition what is complete. In this way, the complement no longer appears as an additional element, but better as a different way of considering things. This idea is found in certain texts. When Bacon says, for example, that it is not because the Christian intervenes at a later age historically that he completes the task, the task of philosophy, according to a logic of increase, but because he shows the philosopher his own imperfection. And in this sense, he completes the task of revelation by completing philosophy. Therefore, Christianity doesn't add something, but adds better the light that illuminates the whole history of wisdom. This means that theology appears as external and foreign to philosophy only from the point of view of the unbeliever. That is to say, of the one who doesn't understand the scope of universality, because he does not see the imperfection of his own state. Simple and Augustine <laughs> from back is this in this explanation, quite uh, remarkable. On the contrary, the Christian who places himself from the, from the point of view of the intimacy of theology with philosophy sees real universality. In a way, as I already said, converting to Christianism is for Bacon the only way to access to in to access the universality of knowledge. However, <laughs> uh, there is one last difficulty. Uh, great difficulty, uh, and if I can take some minutes more, uh, coming to a conclusion, I will explain it. The universality of Christian theology seems to be based on the universality of human experience as it explores the properties of things described in the scriptures. Yet, Bacon maintain, maintains at the same time that the mysteries of experimental science are reserved for initiates. I will try to address this difficulty in the last part of my presentation about the Christian Republic. The education reform was only the first step in a more ambitious, ambitious project. The reform of the, of the whole society for human beings are called to live in peace in order to achieve earthly happiness. Bacon proposes here an astonishing and remarkable project, rather isolated in his century, the project of a Christian Republic. In short, the Christian Republic is not Augustine's city of God, <coughs> sorry, for it is not heavenly, but it is terrestrial. It is not a utopia either, neither can it be reduced to the church, even if it does not differ radically from the church. The Christian Republic is better a project of social reform in order to establish a peaceful society. What are the means of this peace? philosophy, as it serves Christian theology. What are the challenges of such a society? Leading the church to God, leading the church of God, sorry, organizing the people of the faithful and protecting borders much more effectively than the Crusades did, for brutes war are of no interest. How does it happen in practice? The promotion of sciences will, be, will make it possible to benefit from a longer life, from the goods of fortune, from social justice and from peace. What a program. <laughs> the frontiers uh, Bacon talks about are not the current borders of Christian countries. What he has in view is to extend this republic to the whole world. <laughs> Very ambitious project. Indeed, for him, wisdom is revealed by God and is therefore universal. However, it is only fulfilled in and through Christianity because it is the only universal religion. As Etienne Gilson says, if the pagans are part of this republic, it is on the only condition that they cease to be pagans and become Christians. Well, Bacon puts forward 17 
this thesis, which constitute a charter, a real universal charter of truth necessary for the development of this Christian Republic. But this universality looks much more like a universality de jure than a universality de facto, since Bacon agrees with Averroes on the need, need to entrust the organization of education and worship for the multitude to a philosophical elite. In order, why? In order to avoid, he says, the proliferation of superstition. Bacon even agrees with Seneca on the need for the philosopher to conceal the truth of, in his teaching and to agree with public religion only because of public law and common practice. Could the elite be the price of this universalization? I have no real answer to this question. And coming to a conclusion, could we say that Bacon saved the philosophical spirituality peculiar to ancient wisdom? Yes, in a sense, when he recalls the practical and theological finality of philosophy against the speculative tendency of the academic philosophy in the university, which could lead uh, one to believe that wisdom belongs to only to metaphysical discourse. But no, in that ethical finality of philosophy does not ultimately belong to it, but derives from something foreign to it faith in Christ. However, as we have seen it, the addition of faith to philosophy is not presented as something foreign to philosophy, but on, but on the contrary, as which most intimately re reveals it, um, its usefulness and its circuit nature. As an heir to Augustine, Bacon considers philosophy and theology as profoundly complementary. As an heir to Averroes, he underlines the importance of education and social reform. But this is precisely here that a shift occurs by taking care to save the complementarity between philosophy and theology, Bacon, as Jeremy Hackett has shown, leaves to philosophy the fruitful tension between the profane and the sacred, a tension which must, so to speak, remain undetermined, so as not to reduce wisdom to its either strictly philosophical or strictly theological side. But, this is at the cost of an exteriorization of the works of wisdom, caught up in extremis by Bacon's insistence on the need of an elite, watching over secrets that are incommunicable to the vulgar, an exteriorization which calls for an apocalyptic structure of the history of reason and simultaneously for the very modern idea of the foundation of discovery in, in experience. The self-transformation promoted by ancient wisdom, which encouraged the individual to integrate the cosmic order uh, by a philosophical self-finalization, slips here towards a dynamic of appropriation of knowledge, which transforms the individual only to the extent that he actively participates in the collective movement for the development of sciences, and therefore for the development of a Christian republic. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you, Odile. That was wonderful. Thank you so much um, for your excellent talk and very interesting talk. Um, so I'll open the floor to uh, questions. Um, I'll stop the recording. So thank you to anyone uh, watching at home for watching this video.